Okay, I'd like to invite Kathy Olson Tracy, Jennifer Foster, and Whitney Thompson to unmute and start the presentation. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for um, joining us today for the State of the State. Um, it's been an unprecedented year and experience, and this opportunity is designed to update you on what's happening and to allow you to provide feedback and give us your input, and at the end, ask questions. So I will go ahead and um, go ahead and start our our vision today is to talk about the impact of COVID-19 and our response. This is a conversation with Jennifer Foster, uh, the Deputy Executive Director of the Illinois Community College Board. In her role, she oversees all of CTE and all of adult ed as part of um, everything she, she accomplishes each day. Next slide. So the moderators, um, myself and Whitney Thompson, the Senior Director for Career and Technical Education. So we have designed the questions to ask Jennifer um, based on some of the most frequently asked questions we've heard from you and some of the things that we know that are, are pressing and that you want to be addressed. So Whitney, I'll hand it over to you for the first question. Thank you, and I just want to make sure everyone's time. aware that we're we're switching uh, a few things around this morning. And um, Jennifer, you can your uh, audio is working, correct? And, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we uh, navigate this virtual yeah. world. Yes, it's working. Perfect. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us, and we appreciate um, you using the chat feature to stay engaged with us. Um, this morning, if you could just type in the chat who is with us today, that we have over uh, 300 participants in this session right now, um, and let us know, you know your name, where you're from, and who you represent, adult education, uh, career and technical education, whether you're an administrator, an instructor, maybe you're with secondary education, uh, workforce, right? We know that we engage a variety of stakeholders for our Forum for Excellence conference. Great, we're seeing lots of folks type in the chat. Keep, keep those coming. All right, next slide, please. So COVID-19 has brought on um, unprecedented challenges to uh, Illinois, to the nation, to the world, and especially has had a significant impact on higher education, our community colleges, our adult education providers, and most importantly, our students. Jennifer, how has ICCB responded to the impact of COVID-19? Good morning, everyone, and I'm so happy to and pleased to be here with you to just talk a little bit about what's what's going on in our world uh, that we live in. And we hear people all the time say this is the new normal. And so we want to just provide you with a little bit of information um, about uh, what we've been doing in terms of responding to COVID. We have definitely worked with the governor's office and uh, the Department of Public Health uh, to make certain that we are following all of the the different uh, policies, rules, procedures for protecting ourselves as well as our students and also um, the faculty. Uh, we developed uh, a COVID-19 webpage uh, that was designed to provide uh, the system as well as of, of anyone of interest about what is happening in our um, in our world uh, as we 
look at our community college campuses as well as our adult education campuses, making certain that we provide uh, answers to questions. We developed a way that we could um, uh, imp get those questions um, from you. Uh, we developed a, a portal where you could go in and you could uh, type in your questions and we were very quick uh, to answer those questions and put those back out on our website. So we wanted to make certain that we were adhering to all of the, the, um, the questions that were out there. And you can imagine back in March, um, we came to work on March uh, 14th, I believe it was. And then uh, on March 17th, we had to call all of the staff and say, it, you have to stay home. So you can imagine it, it, it caught all of us uh, off, off guard. So uh, we were able to develop um, a return to campus or a return to campus committee that was consistent of career tech and technical education uh, experts, as well as adult education, uh, in order to inform a plan of helping to move uh, the system forward. So as we started to discuss, you know, how we were going to return, were we in phase three, phase four, phase uh, the other phases, we wanted to make certain that campuses had the latest information in order to make informed decisions. Each, each um, community college campus uh, had, uh, has uh, already started the process. And so you're well aware of what's happening on your particular campuses. And so we wanted to make certain that there were a set of principles, a set of, of, of policies, procedures that every campus had. Uh, it didn't take away from what your institution uh, has to do in terms of working with your local local departments of, of health. Or, and so we wanted to make certain that we had just a, a little bit of a snippet of making certain that um, you had everything that you actually needed in order to get up and running. We know that we couldn't think of everything and we know that things still are, are cropping up, but we wanted to make sure that we were bringing a lot of different uh, things. We, we also looked at policies. We looked at policies and procedures that we could kind of relax uh, during this time frame. For example, we relaxed policies for adult education, the 45% generation uh, uh, policy. So that was a, a, a huge issue in the adult education arena. They didn't have to worry about uh, whether or not we were going to generate those funds. So we did uh, do some suspension of that. We also uh, looked at grants, and I'm sorry, I have the nice little echo of the train in the background, so I do apologize. Um, but we did look at um, some grants and continuation uh, plans, and we made some decisions that we would not move forward in a competition. Um, we extended some grant opportunities. We disseminated uh, resources in terms of CARES resources, gear resources, um, as well as adult education uh, had funds that we put out in order to increase technology. So that is the, that is a pretty much in a nutshell. We we try to uh, think and envision what it is that not only the programs and the colleges needs are, but we we also wanted to make certain that we were responding to some of the student needs. Um, professional development for faculty was definitely something. So we wanted to make certain, uh, and this, this conference is just an example of what we are trying to do in order to make sure that professional development um, happens. Shifting from uh, a face-to-face to a online remote distance education format is a difficult uh, is a difficult thing, it, and especially if you um, if you don't have the that experience working with online technology. So we hope that as a system, we hope that the ICCB has provided you with the technical assistance necessary in order for you to make make some of your decisions.
Thanks, Jennifer. Next slide, please. So um, we're looking at a lot of challenges uh, that colleges have experienced as it comes to COVID-19. Our colleges are um, community-based organizations, our ROEs, um, and all of our programs. So when these challenges um, are occurring, we are also starting to see innovation and it's pushing us towards that. So do you have any um, broad images or ideas of what's happening across the state where our providers are overcoming these COVID-19 challenges? Yes, there, there are quite a few, and I'm pretty certain that the audience can also chime in during this time as well. Um, but we've seen uh, lots of support that has happened uh, from our colleges and even within the communities. Uh, uh, the colleges have um, instituted some Wi-Fi spots in parking lots, um, online CTE courses moving from um, moving from that face-to-face, -face. and in a CTE world, that's sometimes very difficult because it is the training aspect. So if you're looking at a welding, it's kind of hard to put a welding program on, uh, on, online when you have to do the welding. Uh, so uh, the CTE folks and faculty have definitely come up with some ways in which uh, they can do some of the instruction. But then we offered an opportunity uh, later for individuals to come back on campus to kind of finish some of either lab requirements or fulfilling some of the, the career technical education requirements. Also, um, increased distance learning opportunities. Um, in adult education, we push forward a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, different vendors came to play and said, you know, we can help with this. We can help individuals with this. We increased our um, online presence. Maybe they were using Zoom. Maybe you were using WebEx. There are a lot of different platforms uh, that are out there. And so um, I think that all of our um, providers were very um, um, intuitive and tried to do the very best uh, that they could, technology lending libraries, um, hotspots, all of those different things are very important uh, to, um, to this whole process. And so we wanted to just, um, that conversion from face-to-face -to, -face to an on, online uh, format is, we, we recognize it's really difficult, but we know that there were lots of innovations that our colleges pushed forward. Absolutely. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So using our chat feature, um, I invite you to share some of your innovations um, to overcome the challenges presented by COVID-19. In, in the adult ed space, I've seen Many adult ed programs shift to a virtual enrollment and um, web-based intake. And this is something that's moving towards um, a whole new way to deliver adult ed. So I would love, um, oh, there's one who said they're providing virtual field trips for our bridge classes. That is an excellent idea. Um, Okay, all the, the default for this setting is that your responses are only going to the panelists. If you want to have everybody see that, please click that and go to all panelists and participants, and we'll all be able to see these wonderful ideas. Um, these learning hotspots, laptops, and even desktops, these innovative lending libraries are really helping move us forward. Okay. OK, 
Okay, so we have some other folks typing in that, oh. they, mm -hmm. that they are doing some great things to make sure that they're still celebrating the successes of their students, right? We want to make sure that we're elevating our students during this time and uh, drive through graduations for our, our graduates. That's really important too. Absolutely. Virtual enrollment processes, you know, we'll talk in it here in a few slides, we will ask Jennifer some questions about how she thinks higher education will, will look post COVID. And I think we're going to see a lot of these virtual uh, processes exist and probably be strengthened afterwards. So thank you for putting that in there. So I think we can go to the next slide. And I really liked all of these comments because this is showing that you're thinking about those things. And as we talk about um, moving, um, what, what will it look like um, afterwards? Um, these, um, a lot of these ideas, uh, we wanna make certain that we're, we're capturing. Uh, we are offering hybrid courses, have technology lending libraries, or using Zoom, utilizing larger open space to account for social distancing, um, trade simulations. Um, that, that's something that's really, really good. Um, In-person one-on-one training on how to use Zoom or WhatsApp. So a lot of different um, orientation methods, counseling methods, uh, recruitment methods uh, are happening online where individuals are actually calling in virtual tours rather than just um, coming on, on campus, those virtual tours. So this is a lot of innovation and a lot of thought has gone into a lot of these different practices. And I think that that is something that we can definitely hold on to uh, as we talk about the future a little bit later. Absolutely. All right, next slide, please. So Jennifer, um, what role does CTE play in a COVID and post COVID world? Well, um, CTE plays a very important role because one of the, the, the areas that we uh, talk about all the time is those short-term uh, training uh, in high demand, high, high um, wage um, areas. So I think just that, that little bit or that particular phrase has a lot of meaning. I think before uh, we kind of took it for granted, this is career technical education, we're going to do this, we're, um, we, we do it all the time. But I think now um, as a part of COVID, um, it has a different meaning because what it, what it will do is um, career and technical education has to be ready to retrain individuals. Some of the jobs that uh, were lost as a result of COVID and, and everyone knows that our, our unemployment rates are, are um, higher than they were before uh, March 17th. Um, so we know that those jobs, a lot of the hospitality jobs, um, not a lot of travel is happening right now. And so, um, Career technical education is going to be important in order to retrain individuals. Uh, we've heard a lot, uh, we've talked about technology and having to move our instruction. Uh, a lot of businesses are looking at ways in which they can move a lot of their, um, a lot of the, the um, things that their employees do, do it online. So there's going to be a lot of, um, in terms of CTE playing a, a huge role in how our workforce um, um, moves forward. So now more than ever, uh, CTE is, is just vital uh, for, for our nation. It's vital for our learners, for our employers. 
it's going to be that economic uh, um, uh, recovery that's going to have to lead us into uh, these jobs of the future. Uh, CTE can provide opportunities for individuals to kind of upskill, making certain that they are equipped with the, the latest and the greatest skills in order to re-enter the workforce. Um, the, the, the majority of our new or replacement jobs went to those um, individuals with associate degrees and advanced post-secondary credentials. So some of the entry level positions that we have, we're going to have to gear up our integrated education and training programs, our bridge programs, because that's what's going to pull our individuals into. We've talked about this before, that a high school equivalency is not going to do it um, at this point. We need to make certain that individuals have some sort of a short term uh, certificate. Uh, completion rates among CTE graduates is nearly double than that of their, their non-CTE peers. So we need to make certain that we are providing uh, the necessary services in order to get folks um, on the, on the, on the um, uh, cusp of all of these new jobs that will occur. We're, what we're hearing right now is that there are jobs. And there are jobs that are available uh, out there, and employers are looking for folks. But what is happening is that our our individuals have have um, they're vacating, or they've been laid off, or or let go from jobs uh, that are that our employers um, are not um, requesting at this point. So they have a trade, they have a skill. So we have to upskill those folks in order to get to those jobs that the folks need. And, and what we're hearing is that currently there, is, there are not enough workers to fill these jobs. So we have to figure out within our system what are those jobs and try to take a look at what our local workforce data is actually saying because we know that that local workforce data has significantly changed uh, over this last um, few uh, months. So uh, we need to take a, a, a relook at what is happening, where are the trends, where are the jobs, and use CTE as a vehicle to uh, move all of our students forward. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That, that is completely right. And there are a number of uh, research studies that are coming out now, you know, reflecting on the, the 2008 recession and how this one um, will have similar effects, but, but of course different because we are in a virtual environment and responding to a pandemic. But uh, CTE and adult education, as you're soon going to talk about, will have a massive impact on our economy. Um, and so our, our system needs to be ready to respond to that. So thank you for sharing that. And I, and I see something, Whitney, in the, in the chat uh, from one of our uh, um, attendees that were talking about inmates when they get out of prison and uh, how do we meet the needs of this population. It's going to be imperative that uh, as, as a community that we're, we're, working together in order to provide um, um, information to all of our inmates that come out of prison, where education is, where CTE programs are, where the specialized programs are. We have lots of grants that are out there currently. We have the Innovative Bridge and Transition Grant. We have the Workforce Equity Grant. How do we get uh, our um, returning citizens to these services. And I think that the key is, is that we have to, um, we have to gauge that conversation within the community and get folks to the areas where they need to be. So I would say our community-based organizations, our community colleges um, have to come up with a plan so that we can make certain that these, these individuals are served. So I would say the first place to go 
is to go to your educational institutions to try to get individuals into additional training. I think this is going to be helpful uh, not only to our returning citizens, but also uh, to our other populations, which I know we're going to get into talking about equity and uh, looking how we're looking at equity gaps uh, within our system. Uh, but I think that that is very important. Everybody is important, all students are important, and we have to make certain that we're looking at all of the different gaps in the services and making sure that we're filling those gaps. Great, thank you. Thank Next you. Slide. Um, Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we're looking at adult learners and, um, you know, the skills that they need to develop with adult education and CTE programs serving a vital role in our recovery. How are we increasing our presence in the community? So, you know, we're looking at how is ICCB helping improve or increase the presence of education in the local communities across the state. Okay, so um, I guess that's a question for me or is it a question for the audience? I think that I would like to see from an audience perspective, I would like to see, um, you know, what are some of the things that you're doing at the local level to try to engage um, uh, some of the low-skilled adults. Uh, we know that um, uh, that Reese focused a lot on yesterday. He talked about a population from 18 through 64. He talked about uh, populations 25 to 44, that working age population. We know that 55, 56% of the population in adult education that we service are individuals that um, English is not their first, first language, so English as a second language. Uh, we know that another uh, 31, 32% of the population are individuals that function below uh, uh, nine grade levels of equivalency. Um, so we know that individuals are coming to us that have disabilities. So we have to uh, make certain that we are working with individuals, starting things, uh, career technical education uh, programs and pre-bridge programs at those lowest levels. I think those things are going to be very important that we start introducing quickly um, the studies have shown that if individuals are in, um, in um, uh, instruction that they're interested in, their reading literacy levels uh, kind of, they go up. Uh, so we need to make certain that we're introducing those things that folks are really, really interested in because I think it's, it's going to be important. And again, I would, I would um, like to know um, in, in those communities how um, individual programs and colleges are increasing their presence within the community uh, and, and doing more outreach with the targeted populations. I, um, I think we have to analyze the data. We have to find out what platform we need to use. Uh, if we're looking at individuals that are 18 through 24, and some would say upwards of, of, of 40, 44, um, and I will get my age in there, that we're looking at different pl platforms of, of delivery of recruitment methods. Um, constantly, individuals, I have a 21-year-old a, a in my household that is constantly on the phone and constantly doing this. So um, she is not going to go to a laundromat to take a little slip off of a board at a laundromat and and try to get into 
of uh, the program. She's just not going to do that. Number one is because she thinks that mom should still do her laundry. Um, but we want to make certain that we're tailoring that message to um, to the individuals that we're serving. So it may take a little bit more of a concentrated effort. Adult education has been just um, has been over the years, and I've worked in adult education for a long time, taught in the inner city. So we are we we have always and been accustomed to the learner just comes to us. So now with with COVID and now with um, differing um, uh, ways of, of of trying to communicate with people, it's a little bit different because people are not not coming. And this was happening before COVID as well. So we have to figure out how we're increasing our our presence within the community. How in in terms of CTE, how CTE is serving this vital role within the nation and uh, it, within our communities. What jobs are out there? How do we make certain that the CTE offerings that we're having, that we're offering within our our college systems, how are they helping to? Um, provide jobs within our community because one of the things that's going to revitalize our community is that you have jobs and you have people to fill those jobs. Thank you. Um, I think those are a lot of things that we need to be thinking about and, and outreach and building our presence so we can get to our students, as you said, we are used to our students coming to us, and now we kind of have to go to them. So um, next slide, please. So as you're looking at, um, this is time for your feedback. As you're looking at how to increase that presence, we want to hear from you. So please use the um, chat feature and share um, how you're increasing your presence in the community to perform outreach and recruitment. It can be virtual or it can be any innovative ideas. I'd love to hear what you guys are doing on some of this. Um, we've, I know we've got some great ideas out there. And I know, Kathy, right now with the um, a lot of, uh, of uh, that we can't uh, go and visit each other, we can't sit down and have face-to-face -face meetings. So we understand, and someone just put it in the chat, that there are a lot of virtual uh, sessions and things that are going on, uh, a lot of meetings that are happening, happening virtually. Um, I think I've had more meetings during uh, uh, COVID uh, than I than I had previous to that. So it's kind of uh, you know those online meetings um, are 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 great. We are still learning how to make certain that those um, those meetings um, happen the way we want them to. You have to make sure that there is the mm -hmm. interaction, but we still have to have those. And I think that. Um, you know, that's a good way. And someone said promoting the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, you read my mind, because that is going to be very important. We're going to have to work with our local workforce boards, our one-stop centers, um, our business and industry centers within community colleges, our career technical education, adults, everybody is going to have to work together um, in order to make certain that we know where the jobs are, how do we increase our presence within the community? And how do we make certain that people uh, know what we're offering? And, and I think these are really key ideas. And I want to highlight some of the things that we talked about yesterday um, at the Adult Education Administrators meeting is this all of this outreach is now happening virtually. So to make it a part of a plan, I'm seeing um, live Facebook interviews with students. What a great word of mouth um, tool to get that out. And what I would also say is um, we talked yesterday about using Instagram and doing these short 
uh, two to three minute clips um, about your program, uh, teaching tips to get people following that, because once they do that, it's only a step away from getting into that virtual enrollment. We also mm -hmm. talked about making sure everything connected. Some of these virtual ideas that you're doing, the virtual showcases, to pop those up on a YouTube channel and have an actual YouTube channel for your program. So, Because where do our younger students go if they want to learn something? They're going to go to YouTube so they can find you there. Um, so there's all about making all these connections virtually so that there's no wrong virtual door. If a student looks up um, Instagram, they're going to find you. If they look up YouTube, they're going to find you. If they look up Facebook, they're going to find you. And that's kind of that virtual presence that we're all building. Um, I had some really good ideas from the admin meeting yesterday, and they're all looping back into um, just kind of creating that comprehensive marketing plan, boosting ads on your Facebook and your Instagram, um, Google ads, things like that are really um, where our students are going to be. If they're not out in public, they're not going to see a flyer that we have posted. How are we going to get to them? So some of these virtual ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I've seen some really great ideas. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, this is a question that we've heard a lot yesterday and I've seen today. Um, adult education enrollment is trending downward. What are the expectations for FY21? Uh, audience, I think they're giving me all the hard questions and how, how all of the these questions um, um, are just trying to get at what what we're what our new direction. So I think they're giving me all the hard questions. So I'm going to think about a question to give give to these two. Um, but adult education enrollment is trending downward. We have been this week. We're celebrating um, Adult Education Week. Uh, we're uh, celebrating our successes. We know that we have faced challenges over the last few months. Um, we know that um, they're, uh, nationally, the numbers are trending downward. We're working with um, the um, uh, Department of Education. Uh, we're, our National State Directors uh, Association is working to look at our numbers and why we're trending downward. Yesterday, in preparation uh, for a meeting that I was going to, I did a look at our overall uh, funding structure. Back in 2002, adult education was funded at, at the federal level at 20, a little bit more than 24 million, 24.6 million. Today, we're funded at 22 million and that's not that includes um, you know our professional development our state administration and all of the the 82 and a half percent of the funds that actually go out to programs so i i think what is happening is that we know that inflation has increased we know that salaries have increased and i think that what is what is happening is that the amount of funding, well, I can see it, the amount of funding that we have has decreased uh, over, over the last few years. And as I was talking to our executive director, uh, Dr. Brian Durham, um, and our chief of staff, Matt Berry, we were talking about we need to have some sort of a renewed uh, appreciation uh, for adult ed, a new um, um, filter of resources that actually come into um, adult education. Um, our expectations in terms of, of our, our enrollment, yes, it's trending downward, but what we're seeing is we're seeing that folks are staying a little bit longer. Now, uh, COVID, this COVID time between um, March and now, this is a little bit of an anomaly. But we're, what we're seeing is that folks are staying longer. 
So I'm, I feel good to say that our quality of our adult education programs uh, have um, increased. We know that we have had to align with the Common Core college readiness standards. So there are just a, an array of um, there, there's an array of different um, uh, reasons as to why individuals uh, are not coming. The, the high school equivalency test uh, changed. It increased in price. Uh, individuals uh, during this time, some individuals don't want to come back to our different campuses, um, but um, individuals are, some individuals are liking technology. So there are a lot of different reasons. Uh, adult education has changed. Adult education used to be a solely a literacy program, but as someone mentioned in the chat, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act has brought it uh, a little bit further, that not only do we need to do literacy, but we also need to get people prepared for employment. So I think um, th there is not one thing, Kathy, that we can point to to say uh, that this is the problem but I am, um, you know, the expectations for this next year, I think they're going to be the same. We're going to have to do things a little bit differently. Uh, we're going to have to take a look at our, our instructional offerings. We have to take a look at our data. We have to determine what classes are working, what classes may not be working. Do we need to look at more of an online format for adult education? in order to be able to reach the entire population. I think we just talked about how to recruit individuals, but how do we retain individuals within the system and making certain that as we're retaining those individuals, are we giving them the services that they need? Maybe we need to look at some of those quick, fast approaches, looking at our uh, David Alt's presentation yesterday, looking at you know, those numbers, those groupings of numbers, looking at who we're serving. Uh, are we serving, um, what does our white population, our Hispanic population, our African American population, our Asian community, what is that actually looking like? And determine where those gaps are. And we're going to have to, we're, we're going to have to make certain that our recruitment, our retention strategies are fit with the groups that we're working with. So it's a little bit more of a, a concerted effort to look at those different groups. Reese's presentation yesterday talking about rebranding of, of adult education. I was glad to hear uh, Kathy and Amy talk about this, but it's, it's very important that as we're looking at, at um, equity, as we're looking at access, as we're looking at inclusion, that we're making certain that we're, we're looking at our branding. And our branding may have to change for the different uh, groups uh, that, we, that we have. Um, so we want to make certain that we're, we're um, moving individuals, we're messaging uh, the way we should, looking at Illinois work, WorkNet, increasing our professional development, I know that our instructors would love to teach the way they used to, um, but things have changed. And so instituting standards and things of those natures are requirement of, requirements of WIOA. So we're going to have to make certain that we're providing professional development as a requirement, not only for adult education, because community college enrollment also is uh, trending. Um, uh, and have trending a little downward. So we're going to have to make sure that our career technical education programs, uh, if they're going to be the kind of the, the savior of, of, of our economy, then we're going to have to make certain that we're, we're helping to spread the message, uh, especially as adult education and career technical education intersect. This is great information, and I want to um, 
give a shout out when I said, share your success stories with us so that we can amplify them. I've already gotten an email with a couple that we will um, share in our media stories so that we can amplify your successes. And I do want to just highlight, Jen, you know, we, we look at what the expectations are, but to um, remind all of our adult education programs, they're not out there alone. Because along with the expectations, the ICCB has, you know, a lot of support systems in place. Um, you, you have access to your regional support. We're doing monthly uh, webinars where you, we're listening to what your concerns are so we can pivot quickly and adapt. We are updating our um, marketing and recruitment strategies for a statewide deployment so that we can help recruit students. So while we are saying these, these expectations hold true, we're also putting a lot of support, resources, and effort into helping programs achieve these expectations. So as mm -hmm. you're working through these and adapting and um, possibly struggling in this new normal, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We have an exceptional PDN. We have great staff that are, are going to um, hop on and help you get what what you need to get done. So remember, you're not in this alone. Um, so in the next slide, please. So Jennifer, equity and innovation is the theme for this year's conference. In times of turbulence or disruption such as COVID-19, equity tends to fall off as a priority, right? As we think about the all hands on mm -hmm. mentality and, and the, the reactive, uh, response to the, qu the quickness in, into which we've had to react to this. Um, mm -hmm. Keeping in mind that this pandemic continues to exacerbate inequities for marginalized communities, what are the ways in which the board is prioritizing equity, especially now? Well, um, if we, uh, let's talk about uh, our career and technical education program plan that we just submitted and, and was approved. Uh, that uh, Dr. Lopez talked about in his opening comments. So that plan, that career and technical education plan, has set the set the the goal of equity as being um, premier in what we do, uh, highlighting equity uh, as a part of making certain that we're looking at those that are disproportionately uh, served as a part of our, our system, making certain that these individuals have that access and they are included as a part of what we do. Now more than ever, uh, during um, this, this COVID pandemic, we have to make a concerted effort to make certain that we are um, focusing on individuals uh, that may not be serviced in our in our communities. So looking at the data and determining whether or not we are who are we serving, who are we serving? You know, if we're looking at African Americans, we know that uh, career and technical education uh, instruction has increased, and the number of certificates um, has increased. Um, but we are also seeing that African Americans are not increasing at the level of the other populations. So we have to make certain, and especially during these times of COVID and some of the um, things that have happened in the, in the media over the course of the last few months, we need to make certain that we're, we're prioritizing education and we're uh, prioritizing different groups to make certain that they have the access to the education. Um, our board has really put uh, equity as a top priority. Uh, at a recent meeting here in September, just a, a, about a week ago, our board uh, approved uh, three goals, and one of those goals has to do with equity. And so our board uh, has continued, had the discussion at its August uh, retreat, and uh, we had um, uh, the, um, I forgot the name, sorry, uh, the University of Illinois 
to come in and have a conversation with the board about equity. We broke down a lot of different things. We looked at what the trends are within the community college system uh, uh, in terms of equity. So our board is making equity a top pri priority. We're looking at ways uh, in which we can innovate. Um, we have, um, um, I spoke earlier about an innovation bridge and transition grant that's out there that's actually due tonight at 11.59 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. Uh, but we have, um, we're looking for innovation. We're looking for ways, uh, and we put equity as a part of that particular grant because we want to make certain that we're looking at those things that will help to bring uh, the different populations into education. Because we all know, uh, and I'm looking at the number of participants, 370 participants, we all know that education is the key to our students' success. Um, and it, the success in getting into employment and their, their just overall success in life. So I think that by our board making uh, equity a top priority and continuing those discussions within our, com our committee structure of our board, we are breaking down and we are looking at the community college data and we're trying to look at best practices that are happening not only um, uh, outside of, of Illinois, but also inside of Illinois, because all of our institutions are doing something. And so we want to, we want to look at those best, practice, best practices, and we want to showcase those, because we can all learn from each other. We don't have that quick fix uh, on everything, but we can say that we are prioritizing those. As a, as a state, what we're doing, the governor's office has put equity as a, as a top priority. Uh, we are going to be looking at uh, equity metrics. Within our um, agency, we have to develop equity plans. Um, we want to help and work with our, our um, providers as well as our colleges and helping them to address equity as a part of what, um, of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we have the University of Illinois that's going to do a presentation here a little bit later um, and um, talk about uh, equity. And, and so we need to talk about it. Uh, sometimes we don't want to, but I think it's very important to make certain that the discussion is there and our board is definitely um, speaking uh, out uh, about this. And I think Dr. Lopez and I thank him for mentioning that as a part of his comments that we have to take a look at what is happening with our students. And if, are our students uh, getting those certificates? Are they earning those associate degrees? Are they making, are they transferring to our four-year universities? So the, this is the time that we really need to look at that. Thanks, Jennifer. I, I think your um, assertions there are spot on and, and really refreshing for um, today's environment. All right, next question or next slide. So we talked about this earlier in the conversation about how higher education will look post COVID, right? So what are some long-term effects or changes that our education system will need to embrace in a post-COVID world, and, and, and what does it look like? Well, I think um, that we're going to have to be able to respond, Whitney, quickly. Um, things are, we know how quickly things have evolved over these last six, seven, um, almost eight months now. Um, so we're going to have to be nimble. We're going to have to res respond in a way that we have never responded before. Uh, we're going to have to develop programs that are going to um, definitely um, help uh, not only our businesses, and, um, but we're going to have to be able to help our students to gain the skills that they need right away. 
So it's going to be very important that we look at and embrace what we and learn from what we've what we've learned over the last seven eight months. We've learned quite a bit. We've learned that we can um, we can do technology, even though some days we don't want to, um, but we we can do it. And I don't you know I think that some of the things in terms of looking at um, uh, the conferences that have happened. A lot of conferences are going to be virtual. I'm signed up for another three or four more conferences that will be virtual. So I think that as we look at COVID, we need to learn from it. We're actually um, looking at conducting a sort of what is called post-mortem of just kind of looking at, and I know that's just a, a difficult um, term or phrase to use, but we're going to look back and try to determine what are those things that worked uh, effectively and what are those things that we need to be ready when, um, uh, you know, if this happens again or if there's some other disaster that happens. Um, so we, we need to learn, um, look at um, education as a way to um, help us to achieve what we, what we need to. Um, I think that, you know, the, the key is going to be we're going to have to sit down. We're going to have to figure this out. We're not out of it yet. Uh, we're still uh, dealing with COVID, so we're not quite to the post, and I hope that that happens soon. Uh, but we need to make certain that we're, we're planning for the future, but we also need to make certain that we're offering more online classes, more accelerated classes, that integrated education and training classes. We're going to have to make sure that we're looking at other ways to um, recruit and retain our students. Our students are going to need a lot of support, and that's going to be key. Um, those supports are necessary. They may not have hot spots. I think that there, the GEARS money, the CARES money, the adult education resources, um, other resources, and partnerships with other agencies, are, it's going to be key. We have to be able to, um, to support our students because they're going to have a lot, of, a lot of needs. And especially, we have students that are coming to us that, are, that have their students at home uh, in certain areas of the state, that their students are still at home as well. So we need to make certain that we are providing um, uh, all of the supports that are necessary because they're working through with their kids, with technology and, and all of the different um, things that they need. They're, you know, food, food insecurity, those things are real. Those things, transportation issues, childcare issues, those things are real. And we have to help them navigate. I know how difficult it is for uh, some of my family members and some of our staff to navigate uh, these areas. But if you have individuals that are low skilled and don't have the necessary resources that, that you, you have or, or have access to, this can be very uh, difficult, and this can be um, very um, heartbreaking to our students. So we definitely need to make certain that those supports are there. Thank you, Jennifer. Now let's hear from you. What are ways um, that you expect higher education will change. And you can put that in the chat. I think that it would be a really interesting conversation to hear uh, what you're hearing from students, what you're hearing from, from other practitioners in the ways in which the needs of students and employers are changing um, and what education will look like in a post-COVID world. So you can go ahead and put that in the chat. And then um, if, Amy, if you just wanna jump to the end, we have some resources available as well as our contact information. So if you have questions about uh, career and technical education, you can always reach out to me. My email is there. Uh, Dr. Kathy Olson Tracy's uh, email is there as well as Jennifer Foster. And we're all open and available um, to have discussions with you. And we have um, 
many of the resources that Jennifer talked about earlier in terms of ICCB's response are listed there on the left. There are a number of policy guidance, uh, FAQs, uh, as well as resources for administrators and, and instructors alike. So we encourage you to continue to visit that website. And I think with time, Amy, that we um, won't be able to take any additional questions and that we will be moving on to Dr. Wood. Is that correct? Yes, I'm going to, Dr. Wood, I'm going to make you the presenter there or you can um, take control. And while he is getting himself queued up, I'm going to introduce Dr. Wood. Um, we are excited to have Dr. Luke Wood with us this morning. He is the Associate Vice President for Faculty Diversity and Inclusion and a Distinguished Professor of Education at San Diego State University. Formerly Wood served as the Director of the Joint PhD Program in Education between San Diego State and the Claremont Graduate College and Director for the ED Program of Community College Leadership. Wood also serves as a co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab, a national research and practice center that partners with community colleges to support their capacity in advancing outcomes for underserved students of color. And with that, Dr. Wood, if you'd like to share your screen, um, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely, good to be here this morning and thank you for the, the introduction and welcome. And it was very wonderful to hear the the prior conversation, um, lots of good discussion around strategies and practices responding to, to our current times, which are, of course, very um, interesting times and, and difficult times for many of the students that we're, we serve. And so today's conversation is about um, really being attentive to uh, the second pandemic, um, and which is really um, you know, the, the, our country has been engaged, of course, with the first pandemic being COVID-19. We've had, you know, um, di seen disproportionate rates of infections and unfortunately deaths that have taken place in minoritized communities. Um, it has transitioned, many of you heard the, the discussion around the transition to being virtual and still trying to find ways to engage students and how we can do that in, in, um, with really unique constraints. But the other pandemic that, that we are facing is the racial pandemic. And of course it's a pandemic and not an epidemic in that it is a worldwide phenomenon of, of, of challenges that we see that face um, many minoritized communities. And it has its unique um, strain of course here in, in the United States in terms of how we um, use race as a way of um, thinking about groups that are different from ourselves, engaging people. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how all that relates to the topic of microaggressions and what that might look like, really thinking about um, our virtual settings and, and talking about what we can do to help change some of those things. And so looking forward to, to the conversation and very feel very blessed that I was able to hear all the, the prior conversation that was taking place. Um, I just kind of want to ground our, our, our talk today in the concept of equity mindedness has been espoused by a scholar named Estelle Ben Simone. Um, Estelle Ben Simone is a, a newly retired professor from the University of Southern California, and her research center and my research center have done a lot of partnering together looking at what does it take for students um, to be successful in our community colleges and our adult learning centers. and in all the different ways that we educate um, adult learners. Like what, what does it take for them to be successful? And ultimately what, what she thinks is that we have to approach our work from the lens of equity, where we recognize that there are certain groups that are experiencing disproportionate impact who have outcomes that are different from that of their peers. And then once we know that, then we need to engage differently. Uh, first, um, that involves us recognizing the, the role that systemic inequities have in our society, how they influence education, employment, healthcare, our criminal injustice system, um, and of course the work that we do. So we know that uh, our, um, our institutions are systems, but those systems interact with these other systems and that it has created a certain way of thinking about and engaging people from minoritized communities. Part of what happens though, 
is that when people see breakdowns in uh, student success, that students aren't um, learning, growing, achieving in the ways that, that we would like them to, most of the time we see that the response is one that externalizes, that says um, that really there must be some problem with the student, their family, or their community. And so if there's a breakdown in student performance, that that is the reason why it's occurring. And so that's why her two next points after this are so important, because the first thing we do is we don't look at the student, their family, and their community. We begin with a focus on us, institutional responsibility. What are we doing or not doing as educators, um, as classroom instructors, um, as those who work in student services? Like, what are we doing or not doing that's resulting in the challenges that we see? And that doesn't mean that we ignore the fact that there are other challenges. It doesn't mean that we ignore the fact that we're in the midst of a healthcare pandemic. Um, but it doesn't mean that we ignore the fact that there are um, challenges that students face with issues such as food insecurity and housing insecurity. It doesn't mean that we ignore those challenges, but what we say when we see those types of breakdowns is, okay, so what are we doing about those, those breakdowns? Are we ensuring that we're reaching students who are experiencing food and housing insecurity with the resources and support that they need? Are we, are we engaging those challenges from a standpoint of what are we doing or not doing to help to address it? And then that brings us to the third point, as opposed to um, the blame game, right? Which we find typically doesn't produce the types of results that we would like to see. And then finally, our role as educators involves us critically reflecting upon our own roles and responsibilities. So what are we doing within our own roles as in positions as educators, as those in positions of authority that's helping to either extend and reify some of the challenges we see or helping to break down those barriers so that we can create a better environment for students and for their success. And so I use that as, 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 a, as a kind of framework and, and jumping point for this entire conversation because it all is really organized around this notion of equity, that we identify groups that are experiencing outcomes that are different from that of their peers and we provide them with heightened focus and attention to ensure that they get what they need, that they are receiving the type of support that's necessary for them and their success. Now, that brings me to a, a topic of uh, the taxonomy of educators' perspectives. And I know that some of you, in fact, if, if any of you have seen this before, I'd love to see a note in the chat window. Um, but basically what this taxonomy does is it helps us to think about how do we move forward changing our institutions and the people within it to be more responsive to the challenges and needs that we have recognizing that there are different people with different motivations and different level of aptitudes to do this kind of equity oriented work that's, that's, focused, on, that's focused on these communities. And when, when we created this framework, it was really out of doing uh, trainings focused on uh, a similar topic as today where we're talking about microaggressions, but thinking about what does that look like when we talk about microaggressions more broadly. So as it, backing up a little bit, it's very common that when I come to do, um, particularly when we, when we were in person, I'd come to a campus to do a, a training on microaggressions. And I would come into a room, there'd be you know, 30, 40 people in the room, it's a brown bag, people who want to be there are interested in, in the topic, and then we talk about microaggressions. And usually right before that event starts or right as it's ending, the person who's putting it on is like, well, you know, this was really important and I'm kind of disappointed. And I'm like, well, you know, we got a great turnout. What was the concern? And oftentimes what I hear is, well, I had Jerry from chemistry or Alan from HVAC or Sarah from whatever it might be in mind when I put this on because I know that they continuously struggle with microaggressing their students. And that's why we put this on. That's why we were here. But what I'm not surprised um, that you can put on an event um, and that people don't come because not everyone has the same level of commitment to this type, type of work. And so what we found in our work is that really there are two different characteristics that separate out how people respond um, to these issues. And it really comes down to very simple things, knowing what to do, knowledge, um, and that's what you see on the top uh, on the top hand side. Don't know what to do, or you do know what to do. 
So having that knowledge. And the second thing is action, having the willingness to actually go ahead and then do it. And when you take together either being having the knowledge or not having the knowledge or having that action or not having that action, it produces a number of different groups. And ultimately, if we're talking about this through the lens of equity, what we want to really be is that top group, the group that knows what to do and has the willingness to do it, that knows what it takes to support students um, who are adult learners, who come from diverse backgrounds and has the willingness to do it, who's in, uh, in the work every day, making it happen, understanding what to do, how to reach, how to reach the students that we care about. And so with that kind of context in mind, there are these different groups that break out. So the first group that we oftentimes think about is the choir. Um, and the choir are those that know what to do. They know the strategies and practices. They know how to build relationships. They know how to uh, create curricular programming. They know how to even engage people now in this new COVID environment. And guess what? They have a willingness to actually do it. So they know what to do and they're doing it. And the vast majority of times when I engage in conversations like this, it's with people who both know what to do and have that willingness to generally, to generally do it. And so I'm sure that those who are part of the choir are very much over, uh, very much represented here um, today. Um, then we have those who are the allies. These are people who don't know what to do and are unwilling, uh, and, but they still have the willingness to do it. So the difference between the choir and the allies is really knowledge, it's information on what to do. And so we want to bridge that. Then we have the individuals who aren't as committed to issues of equity and diversity and inclusion. They're unwilling to employ the practices and they don't know what to do. And we call these individuals the resistors. And in our work, we really see that there are two different types of resistors, active resistors and passive resistors. So active resistors will actively resist when uh, they hear that there's a conversation that's gonna take place on race and racism and and fragility or microaggressions or whatever the topic might be, they're going to have a visceral response and they're going to um, be vocal. So the active resistors will actively resist. They'll say that this isn't important. They'll send emails out to everyone saying, don't go. Um, and we all know who those active resistors are because they're oftentimes um, very familiar to us. We give them the vocality around these issues. Then there are those who are the passive resistors who rep represent really the majority of those who are resistant and these are people who simply really just want to stay out of the fray. They don't want to get involved in the equity work itself, uh, but they also don't want to make, you know, rock the, rock the boat in any type of way. So they vote with their lack of presence. They just don't go. They just don't engage. Or if they do go, it's because they felt, you know, they felt compelled to do so. And so the other group that we also want to keep in mind are those that have the knowledge, that have the information, but are still unwilling to employ the practices. And we call those the defiant. Now, with these groups, the choir, the allies, the resistors, the defiant, one of the things that, that we found is that there are also people who don't, who don't fall necessarily very easily into these four categories. It's a group of people who represent yet a different group, all right? And that's the people who think they know what to do and really don't. And we call those the oblivious. And there's really three different types of, of oblivious. First, there are those who have a savior complex. They believe that their job is to save, not to empower. And the way I like to think about it is what happens when you bring a deficit mindset to equity work? And that's oftentimes where you can become this person who is there to, to save because you think the, the community isn't able to do it on its own, the students can't do it on their own, rather than approaching the work through an asset-based lens where we're here to cultivate assets and to empower. The second type of those who are part of the oblivious are those that are non-reflective. And these are the people who know what language they use, right? They might say um, um, Latinx as opposed to, to Latino or Latina because it's more gender inclusive. They might know to say equity as opposed to equality because they understand that those are very different connotations, right? They know the language to use um, but they don't necessarily have the actions that go along with it. And so that's a, an important group to keep in mind. And then the third uh, type of oblivious are those that are um, what we call the grandstanders. Uh, you know, if you go back 20 years ago, the conversations that 
we find to be normal course of day conversations on equity, diversity, inclusion were not normal. And you couldn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily a career advancer to be the equity person in your institution. Well, now we are in a, a, a different really world. Um, and in this different world, um, we find that those conversations are more commonplace. And so now someone can make a career on being that equity person. And so we find that there are sometimes people who bring this notion of it's about me and it's a focus on themselves and the grandstanding rather than the true commitment to the work. And you can usually spot this by the fruit of the, of the labor. Like if somebody is, is engaged truly in equity work and they're doing things that sound good, that look good, but that aren't actually translating to meaningful outcomes, then it's probably not really equity at its heart. And so when you look at this, right, and thinking about what does it mean to be an equitable leader in this time, part of what I think it is important for us to do is to say to ourselves, where do I sit on this? Am I part of the choir? Am I an ally? Am I being resistant? Am I defiant? Or am I kind of unaware and oblivious? And if I were to say to you, pick a population, right? Uh, black students, Latinx students, uh, Native American students, our LGBTIAQ plus students, our students who are low income, our students who experience food insecurities and housing insecurities. If I say these different groups, you might be able to point out to yourself where you are. But as I continue naming off groups, many of you might, might want to envision yourselves as being part of the choir, but also being, also being an equity person doesn't assume that we're perfect, right? That there are some groups that you might struggle with in, term, in comparison to other groups. And so that's why we want to bridge that information between the allies and the choir and provide them with the training, the development and learning that they need to be successful. So that's the first thing, right? Recognizing where am I at on this? And also recognizing that it differs across groups. And then the second thing is as an equitable leader, thinking about where are my colleagues? because that's important for thinking about how you reach people because you reach each of these different groups differently and you have different goals. Um, with the choir, our job is, to, um, is really to continue to empower, to empower them with additional strategies and practices that enable them to do the work that they're doing. With the allies, our job is to educate so we can bridge the divide between them and the choir. With our passive resistors, our job is to encourage. And specifically, we want to encourage them to care because if we can get them to care, then we can get them to employ the strategies and practices that are necessary for advancing the outcomes that I know that many of us are so committed to. And so part of what, what we think about when we, when we engage the work on, on implicit bias and microaggressions and other topics that are all interrelated within this within the sphere based upon this framework is this notion that we have to um, use this as an opportunity to advance outcomes. So what do we do? We bring together people who are part of the choir first and we have conversations on equity, on diversity, on inclusion, important conversations that have to take place. But as that group of people is getting ready to leave, whether it's a physical meeting or they're getting ready to log off Zoom, we ask them, who are the other individuals that you know in your own respective units and organizations and institutions who are similarly committed to this work? Like a snowball sample. And then we bring it now yet a larger group of people together the second time. And then we continue to do so, expanding out and expanding out and expanding out until we really try to capture all those who are part of the choir and the allies and galvanize them around these issues in order to be able to advance change. And, and this is a strategy that we've used at a number of institutions. And you know, the truth is it works. It works to do that and to galvanize people. Um, partly though, in order to be able to galvanize people around issues of equity and inclusion and diversity, it takes the honest conversation around bias. Recognizing that all of us have bias and the implicit bias influences the work that we do. And what I put on your screen is just two different definitions and one description of, of bias. And I'll start with really the one from the Kerwin Institute since they've done such great work on um, bias and implicit bias. And it says that implicit bias is the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an implicit manner. So it's our attitudes or stereotypes that we have. 
But it also says that they're activated involuntarily without our awareness or intentional control. So we, there are things that we do, the things that we engage in that we're not necessarily aware that we're doing and they can be either positive or negative. You can have stereotypes about groups that are positive stereotypes that of course still have negative ramifications or you can have a negative uh, connotation, but either way, when there's stereotypes that they're, they're not good, and it says here that everyone is susceptible. It doesn't say that some people are susceptible or that even most people are susceptible, but everyone is susceptible. Every single person in this virtual room right now is susceptible to bias, and we communicate that bias on a regular basis to one another, mostly because of the conditions that we know are more likely to lead to people communicating that bias. We know that there are three primary conditions that when these things are in play, we're more likely to be communicating this kind of unconscious, unspoken bias to one another. The first is when we have situations that involve incomplete or ambiguous information. So I don't necessarily know what the next step is going to be. I don't know where we're going to go. In the COVID-19 pandemic and listening to all the conversation that took place before, clearly there is incomplete information. Things are amb ambiguous. We're in a world where we don't know what's next. The second is when our time is constrained, when we are moving from one thing to the next thing. And I know we're all educators here, so we all are used to juggling multiple things at one time. But when our time becomes further constrained, it makes us make quicker decisions. And those quicker decisions are when our brain starts to fill in the blanks by pulling in traces of past information and those traces of past information are informed by our bias. And then the third uh, condition is when our cognitive control is compromised, when we're experiencing stress or anxiety or anger, or we're experiencing in, insufficient sleep. And so when we look at this, we, uh, you know, we ca call it ITNS, incomplete information, time is constrained, experiencing stress. And I bet every single person on this call is experiencing these challenges right now. And worldwide, we are seeing that these challenges are experienced right now due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we also then have to see how that relates to this racial pandemic and that implicit bias, the conditions for bias right now are at an all time height. They've never been this intense before for this long of a period of time. And given that we are in educating students who are experiencing two different pandemics at the same time that's influencing their ability to be able to be successful and engage in our classrooms. They might experience internet challenge and they're logging in late. There might be the emotional toll of losing families and loved ones from COVID-19. Uh, with the racial pandemic, it's watching over and over and over again on the nightly news, people who look like them, who come from their communities, um, be um, lose their lives at the hands of those who have been sworn to protect them. And so when we, we recognize that there are, there's bias and the influences everyone and all the work that we're doing, it's also important to recognize how it manifests. And mostly one of the big ways that bias manifests is through a concept called implicit bias. Uh, not implicit bias, racial microaggressions. So microaggressions uh, uh, is a term that it was coined by Chester Pierce has been advanced by a scholar named Darrell Wing Su. And it says that they are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral and environmental indignities whether they're intentional or unintentional, they communicate hostile, derogatory, and negative racial slights and insults towards people of color. These are the subtle things. And the most common example that I like to give a microaggression is when someone says to you, um, to me in particular, uh, you know, wow, you're so articulate, but it's not said as a compliment, but as a sense of surprise because they didn't necessarily think that I would be, or I didn't expect you to know that, right? common things that are said but done so in a way um, that can communicate that students don't belong, that they're not as intelligent, that they're not as capable, that they're unable to be able to do the work in the same type of way, that they're dangerous, that they're deviant. And these are the things that we want to, to keep in mind because they influence the daily lives of their students. And again, bias it as a, is at an all time high, microaggressions that are being communicated to our students on a daily basis are also at an all time high. It's important to, re to realize that microaggressions can have psychologically damaging effects. And one of the reasons for this, and has been talked about a lot by a number of different scholars, is that because they are indirect forms of racism, oftentimes people don't know where to place them. Is it me? Is it something that I said? 
And that, that kind of ends up playing with people's minds and it can influence and relate to a concept called racial battle fatigue. Um, before I talk about racial battle fatigue, I'll just give you an example of how, of how scholars are talking about this. And this is from Nadal and colleagues um, who do great work on microaggressions. They said that individuals who perceive and experience racial microaggressions in their lives are likely to exhibit negative mental health symptoms such as depression, anxiety, negative affect, a negative view of the world, and lack of behavioral control. A higher cumulative experience with racial microaggressions may predict more mental health problems. Second, higher cumulative experiences of racial microaggressions predicted depressive symptoms and one's affect or how positively or negatively one views the world. It's also been, this whole notion has been further extended by um, a colleague um, named William Smith, who's done a lot of work on racial battle fatigue. And here's some of the things that he said is that, is that we have to think about the fact that uh, people who are in society who experience racism, that it is a, it is a stressor and a universal stressor that basically um, is part of their life and their life journey. And so he's offered for racial battle fatigue as a framework for understanding the effects that this can have on people, both implicitly and explicitly. So it can have a effect on you physiologically and also psychologically, this continuous um, issues of race and racism. In terms of physiological symptoms, he's talked about people having tension headaches, backaches, elevated heartbeats, upset stomachs, extreme fatigue, loss of appetite, that these are the, the physical and physiological effects of, of having um, a, a bat, racial battle fatigue, of experiencing uh, microaggressions and bias and all these challenges on a regular basis, but it also affects us psychologically. It can lead to constant worrying, to increase swearing and complaining, to inability to sleep. I hear that uh, as a very recurrent pattern from a lot of different people. Intrusive thoughts and images, loss of self-confidence. Um, it can lead to frustration, anger, and depression. And so recognizing all these different challenges, it's important for us to understand what are the, some of the common microaggressions that our students are experiencing because we want to ensure that we're creating an environment that they can learn, grow, develop in a healthy way. And so um, what we want to first recognize with microaggressions is it's not what's said, it's what's really said. And again, it's not what's said, it's what's really said. For example, when someone says, wow, you're so articulate, right? What they're saying is you're so articulate, but what's communicated to the person who's receiving it, if it's said with that sense of surprise, is that you didn't expect me to be. Or when someone says that, hey, I'm colorblind, I don't see color. What the person is intending to say is I believe that everyone should be treated in, in the same way and that we need to respect and love everyone. But what's really being said unconsciously is that really I don't see you. I don't see the, the, the backgrounds and the experiences, the uniqueness that you bring to the table because I don't see color, right? And for a lot of people of color who that is a salient and important identity, saying, saying that cannot necessarily be received in that positive way. So what are some of those underlying messages about what's really being said. And they include this, that, that you're different than us, that you don't belong here, that you're not intelligent or capable, that people of color can be lazy and that your experiences and perceptions are wrong. That if someone says something to you that's a slight and you respond and, and, and bring that to your attention and they say that you're being too sensitive, right? That that's the underlying, that's the underlying messages. A, a message that communicates to students that they're criminal or they're deviant and especially for those, uh, I heard the conversation earlier about students who've been um, uh, justice involved. Like the, those are labels that are attached to them that can, that can be hard to remove once society has placed that on them. I began my work um, doing, working in a community college. My first job was in a community college, working with guys who are coming out of the prison release and bringing them into the campus and, uh, and getting them connected to resources and people and the incredible challenges that they faced um, with just navigating uh, being treated with respect by some educators who didn't perceive them as being a worthwhile commitment from our institution. Um, and obviously that was something that I fought against. There are different types of microaggressions and um, we, we could 
spend the whole day talking about them. And so I, I won't belabor that. But what I will do is talk about some that are very recurrent. And as I do so, I want to also provide some examples to you of how we're seeing some of these challenges break out in our virtual environment. So the first big one that we always see when, we're, when it comes to students of color is what's called a uh, disregard or an ascription of intelligence. And this is when we assume that based upon a person's race, that whether it's a student, a faculty, a staff, a colleague, that they are academically inferior, that they don't have the same ability level. So what are some things that we've seen since the onset of COVID-19? Well, here's a phone call. And these are all real examples. A professor called me about a week after I submitted my paper. She said, I read your paper. Wow, you wrote this. They were shocked that I could write. In the professor's mind, they probably thought to themselves, I'm complimenting the student. But again, if it's said with a sense of shock or surprise, it, it communicates that they didn't expect that they could be. Or during a private chat um, in a chat box window. During the session, another student sent me an email asking if I understood the material being taught. The assumption was that I didn't know. Or in a Zoom breakout session. In my Zoom breakout, I answered a question and then one of the men in the class said, oh, you're smart for a black girl. These are all real examples that, that students hear all the time. Other examples, um, a group, group me, which is an online or a, a, an application that's on um, a lot of phones. It's like a text-based application for group texting. And it says, I'm the only Latina in my class. And this happened in a group me. After the exam, we shared our scores in the group me. I told them I got an A. Someone wrote back, wow, that's really high. You should be proud. But the context of this and may be lost in this particular example is that it was communicated that they didn't expect that they would be based upon their ex prior exchanges with this person. Um, a Google Hangout group project, right? Where students are working in a group project in Google Hangout and someone says, you know, when I give out ideas, they ignore me like I don't exist or that my ideas are bad and I'm the only person of color in the group. Or during office hours, we can have students who are coming in to receive support and encouragement from either faculty or from tutors or from, from, from facilitators and instructors. And I asked a question and he responded by speaking extra slow and exaggerating his pronunciation. Like I didn't know English or something. He obviously doesn't think I'm smart, right? These are the types of things that we normally hear. And ascription of intelligence is one of the big ones that we will always see. Another big one that we'll always see is what we call distrust. Um, and that's an assumption of criminality. We assume that people of color are dangerous or deviant or up to no good, simply based upon their race, based upon their background, that they don't have, um, that they um, are dangerous, right? And so what are some examples in terms of how we see this play out? A discussion board post in a class where someone says, I'm sorry, and I'm not trying to be racist, but people of color come from neighborhoods with lots of crime. It's a fact, just watch the news. Or a Zoom breakout room. I have to be honest, when I'm alone at night, there are times when I worry about being assaulted by a black or Latino male. I'm, it's not that I'm racist, it's just a gut feeling that tells me that I need to protect myself. Or a faculty calling a student assistant who's part of a class and talking about another student saying Latinx students are more likely to plagiarize on their papers than others. I'm not saying that they aren't smart, they just don't understand the language. Again, these assumptions that people are going to cut corners. And the connection between the assumption of criminality and description intelligence is one that we see on a regular basis. For example, this last example, because this assumption that they were academically inferior, right, this description of intelligence, the assumption is that therefore they're going to cheat, right? Um, I'd like to uh, talk about this concept is what happens when, when people of color, students of color, outperform low expectations. Think about that for a moment. What happens when people of color outperform low expectations? If I have a low expectation, if you have a low expectation for my performance and then I do well, is the, the natural assumption is that I must have cheated. I must have cut corners or in some way. Other examples of assumptions of criminality. I wrote the professor to let him know I wasn't able to attend class because my internet was down. And a challenge that I know that many of us have experienced. He wrote back very condescendingly insinuating that I was lying. The student says lots of people are having problems right now or a similar issue in a virtual office hour. I asked my professor for an extension on assignment during virtual office hours, which I was attending on my phone because my computer isn't working. She was like, 
how come you didn't tell me earlier that you were having computer issues? If you would have, I would have been able to grant the request. It was clear that she didn't believe me. These are examples of essentially, again, assuming that a student is dangerous, criminal, or deviant, that they're gonna cut corners based upon their racial background. And then the third big one that we see is disdain. And we see this as part of both second class citizenship and pathologizing culture. And disdain really is when we uh, see a student and based upon their race, we treat them different, where some students are treated with preferential treatment or on the flip side, some students are treated as if they're second class citizens, right? And what are some examples that we see? One example in the research literature is a student responding to a discussion post from, from white male students, a faculty member rather, responding to discussion posts from white, posts from white male students and ignoring posts from students of color. Or in a Zoom cl a classroom where students are raising their hand and, and people are being ignored. This is actually one I hear a lot more um, as, a, as a pattern in K-12. Um, instructor emails. So apparently the professor has been reaching out to students to check in on them, but he's only doing it with his favorite students. All of us black students know that means that he's not reaching out to us anytime soon. Pathologizing culture. When we make those broad statements that they're lazy, they don't care, they're not really here for school. Um, those kind of broad sweeping statements, um, we, we want to think about those as the ways that we pathologize or uh, we have, we have pathologize someone's culture, their values, or even their communication style. So in an online office hour, so I logged on to the online office hours with the professor. I asked a question and his response was, did you do the readings? Because the, the response, the assumption is that they're lazy, they don't care, they're going to cut corners. The student who reported this was very was unhappy with the faculty member because they had been asked this by multiple faculty members assuming they hadn't done the readings when they were doing the readings. And it was a person of color and most of the faculty members weren't from that same background. Phone calls. I was on the phone with a basic needs coordinator who coordinates uh, in this app would be someone you know who coordinates like a, a food pantry, a secondhand clothing closet, et cetera, because I heard that there was emergency money and they came off like I was just there for the money in terms of how they were um, talking to that, that student. So um, I'm gonna skip past the other examples of pathologizing culture and really just do two more before I talk about what we should do in terms of recommendations. So one more that we see is very a very recurrent pattern, not as recurrent as the first ones that I talked about, but still one that we see is different norming. And that's when we say a positive thing about a person and then at the same time say negative things about their community and the people who, are, who come from their community. So as an example, in a group meme, we have a group meme. One of the other students sent me a meme about Chinese people. I'm Asian, so I was pissed. They called me directly to apologize and, and said, I don't think of you as Asian. I wasn't really talking about you. Again, saying, I don't think of you as Asian, like it's a, a positive thing, while then of course that negatively characterize everyone who comes from that background, right? So lots of stereotypes in that. Or instructor feedback. Two comments stood out to me. One said, you write well for a second language learner. The second one, well done. Why can't others be like you? And that's a, the perfect example of how come you're, you're different than the rest. You're better than the rest. You're smart. You're committed. You're not like the others. When we do that kind of, of, of separating students out from their communities, we find that it can be uh, very detrimental. And then the last one I wanna talk about is very relevant in our world of, of COVID-19 is the presumption of defilement. Um, the presumption of defilement. And that says, um, based upon this, you know, the, uh, the, the definition that myself and my colleague Frank have put forward, communication rendered to people of color that suggests that they are generally debased, physically dirty, infected, or diseased. And we have unfortunately, at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic in, in particular, seen a lot of different reaction that negatively characterize our Asian community. And these are real examples here, a class social site. Our class has a closed Facebook page where we share information with one another. There's a student on the page who's always posting memes, but sometimes they're just racist, like jokes about the, you can see virus and stuff. Profile icon. Um, that what someone might have is a Zoom profile. Some people have uploaded uh, profile icon pictures in our group chat that are not pictures of themselves, but of Asian men with gas masks. Again, kind of feeding into this whole notion of, 
uh, of this characterization about the Asian community. We also see this very commonly in the black community. Someone goes to a counter and let, let's not, not use this example in the context of COVID because it might be a very different reason for doing so. But prior to COVID, many people uh, of color, as they would go to a counter and, they're going, and they give money to somebody and they're waiting for them to give back change, have experienced that change being put on the counter or dropped in their hand because people were uh, conscious about, about, about not physically touching them because of these kinds of notions. Or um, very commonly, um, it's something that that you know my wife and I experience pretty regularly. You go into a pool or to a hot tub, and you know you get in, and other people get out. Or you go and you shake somebody's hand, and and afterwards you see them go to the restroom to wash their hand because there's something about you that made them feel like they needed to wash their hands. Again, in the context of COVID-19, these become more complex. But these were issues that happened long before COVID-19, and unfortunately will be with us long after. So what does this all mean? Well, ultimately, if we're going to address these challenges and create a better environment for our students, we have to do three key practices. First, we have to be intrusive. We have to recognize that because of the descriptions of intelligence that tell students that they're academically incapable, that they can't do it, that they're not really here for school, oftentimes those students will then be apprehensive to seek out help when they need it. And many of us may have experienced this with uh, men, with men in particular, there's oftentimes a great, a great apprehension to seek out help for, perceived, for perceiving that they're gonna be viewed as either weak or inferior based upon how we uh, socialize boys and men to be men in very hegemonic ways. And it also happens for our students of color who are worried about reifying stereotypes, a concept called stereotype threat that says that they're academically inferior. So what do we think we have to do? Well, we have to be intrusive first. We, uh, you know, with all of our students conducting informal assessments on their experiences and learning, on what's going on with them, how they're learning, are they using their, their own internet? Are they using a computer? They have the resources that they need. And it involves proactively reaching out to the students, calling them, emailing them, texting them. After George, the George Floyd incident, we stood up a team of faculty and staff members that called every single black student at SDSU, at our campus. Um, we have similarly stood up teams that do weekly phone calls with students um, who come from minoritized communities to check in on them. Are you doing okay? Do you need anything? Connecting them to resources that they might need. It's an important uh, strategy for us to reach out to students before the problem becomes big. All of us have experienced this before where we're trying to work with a student and they start telling us the problem and it's like the building is burning down. And we're thinking to ourselves, if they'd only told us me, me this information when it wasn't this big of a, of a problem, I could have helped to address it a lot easier. And we've all had that happen. And that's why it's so important for us to be proactive in reaching out to students, to monitor their performance and to intervene before it's too late. Well, it's also part of being intrusive is to connecting students to people, not services. Recognizing that there are different people with different motivations within our organizations. And if we're gonna meet the needs of our students, it's not simply just saying, hey, go to so-and-so, right? It's about making that direct connection. Many of us have talked about the concept of what's called a warm handoff, right? But just remember that you can't do a warm handoff to a cold person, right? So it has to be both a warm hand and a warm heart for that person who's on the other side, who's working with those students. Being relational is also a key component of this. Learning about each student and disclosing information about yourself, personal information about your academic journey, your career journey, whatever it might be, particularly as it relates to challenges. We find research-based that students respond to that, that when they find that people can talk about challenges just as that, what they are, the challenges that they've experienced, that they find a connection in that, especially because when they see us in front of the classroom or in front of the Zoom, they see what they believe to be a finished product, a person who's well-dressed and well-spoken, who's doing decent work, and they don't realize um, that connection that, uh, that many of us have to, to struggle, right? And so it's important for us to share that. Um, I do think that there's two caveats with it. First, you never want to make statements of equivalency and say that my experience is like your experience. Uh, it, instead, you just want to talk about challenge for what it is, the cha challenges that you've experienced. And then the second thing with it is that you want to, to, to do so in a way that elevates their voices and their experiences. 
and um, again, avoiding any statements of, of equivalency. You also want to have a general rule of thumb, thumb that uh, as you disclose, you disclose things that you don't mind being all over the place because if you share very personal experience in a classroom, you should know that it's not going to probably stay in that classroom. Um, validating students is also important re relational strategy. I believe, and this is not a, a, a talk on growth mindset because if it was, I would love to go down that rabbit hole. But all I will say is that growth mindset does not fully work for the student populations that we're talking about because the focus on growth mindset is validating students' effort and their hardiness, their, their grit and their resilience, the, the amount of time that they put in. But we also have to recognize that in order for that to be effective, that we have to be validating their abilities and telling them you can do it, you belong here, you can succeed, I believe in you, you have the ability, you are intelligent, are messages that are oftentimes restricted from our minoritized students. And just remember that we have to hold high expectations for all of our students. Said differently, in terms of being relational, you're never going to build a relationship with a student that doesn't believe that you believe in them. No one has ever risen to low expectations. No one has ever risen to low expectations. And so as we keep these strategies for building relationships and being intrusive in mind, just remembering that why we do it is because of this larger context of race and racism, microaggressions and bias in a unique time that requires us to be as intentional, as impactful, as hands-on, more so than we've ever been before in the past. So hopefully those are some words of, of advice that can be uh, supportive for you in the work that you're doing. And I see that there are some comments in, in the Q&A and I'd like to take a moment to address some of those. Um, so one, one that I would like to... Articulate, how can we all learn to praise, uh, to, to praise and sound sincere? Um, I think that it, it comes down to authenticity. So if the student believes that you believe in them and that you're authentic, that they're going to receive it in the way that you intend it, right? Um, so one of the things that we recommend is what's called authentic care. So what that means is that the student knows that if they do well, that you are going to personally feel like you did well. And on the flip side, if they don't, if they stumble, if they fall, if they miss the mark, that you are going to personally feel like you missed the mark. So that's the, the kind of, of connection that it takes to ensure that those relate, that those messages aren't being communicated in that way. Now, how do you praise students? Uh, it's it, one of the things that we believe is that validation can should be tangible and task specific. It's one thing to say, oh, wow, you're so articulate. It's another thing to say, the, the, the debate that you did in class was very well, was very well done. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the points that you raise as an example of what other students could do, right? Now that's tangible and it's task specific. Or I saw the paper that you wrote and it was very well done. Would you mind if I showed it to the class as an example of what they could do, right? In each case, it's tangible, it's task specific, and that makes it, um, it and that certainly makes it much more palatable. And then I also see another question here. Uh, it says, can you talk about the ways in which people from the dominating culture, um, appro uh, culture appropriate culture in higher education to, to the point of weaponizing culture against people of color? Well, I, I think that your, your question uh, says it all already, um, that that can be something that happens, uh, that we can, um, and I think it's important to understand what weaponizing means. Weaponizing is when you take something and then you turn it as something that can be used against someone else. Um, one, in fact, I just uh, co-authored a paper on weaponizing uh, focused on young black girls with my wife and their hair and how um, sometimes in, even in early learning, educators can view their hair from a negative way and then so it can be weaponized against them and used as something to put them down, to degrade them, to gaslight them. And um, so absolutely that's something that we see as a, as a recurrent pattern that is occurring in higher education. So. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that, that point. And I know that we're a little bit over time, but I, if there's one or two more questions, we'd certainly be, be willing to take them.
Dr. Wood, I want to thank you so much for your time this morning. I think the message has been needed and well received. And um, if there are any questions, you can post those in. Um, everyone's just saying just thank you so much for the work that you've done and for sharing your message this morning. I did have one question. Are you willing to share your slides and could we share those out with our audience? Absolutely. Um, as soon as I log off, I will send them to you. Thank you so much. Um, with that, um, I know you, your time is very valuable and you have um, other obligations. So I wanna thank you. I know you can't hear the roaring of the applause that you would if we were in person, um, but everyone is in all the chats. They are very excited about the message that you've shared with us this morning. So I wanna thank you so much for that. Thank At this time, oh, thank you. At this time, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Dawn Hughes, who is the director for the Central Illinois Adult Education Service Center. And she is gonna walk us through some housekeeping items in addition to how we all get to our breakout sessions in this virtual platform. So with that, Dawn, the floor is yours. All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Wood. I don't know if you're still on the line, but you shared so much beneficial information with us today. And we also wanna thank our participants for attending this presentation and also for participating in the chat and the discussions. That was wonderful. As far as providing your feedback on this session, um, we would love to have it for not only Dr. Wood's session, but also any of the other morning sessions that you attended through the Whova app. Um, the yellow arrow on the screen shows you where to click. Just click on the button that says rate session and then you will be able to rate the presenter. Uh, make sure that you do that after each of the sessions that you attend today. That will help us in our planning for the future. Also make sure to follow us on social media for the forum. Uh, we have lots of updates, giveaways, and different uh, type of engagement activities. You can see on the screen right now the different hashtags that we are using, uh, as well as where to find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are also very excited to have a live photo mosaic wall that you will be able to watch come together tomorrow from 8.30 in the morning till 12.30 p.m. Please see your agenda for more details. And on the screen right now, you will also see the number that you would need to text any photos to that you would like to add to the photo mosaic wall. That would be fantastic. And finally, we want to thank our sponsors. We couldn't provide this robust, robust conference agenda without them. So thank you to all the sponsors that you see listed on the slide on the screen right now. You're gonna be able to take a little break right now here soon. And we want to thank you again for sticking with us this morning. All of the sessions today will be recorded. Uh, the morning sessions were recorded and the breakout sessions will also be recorded. So if you, um, obviously you can't attend two at the same time. So you can always go back at a later point in time. Um, next week, we hope to have everything uploaded and you will be able to watch sessions that you weren't, be, weren't able to participate in today. Uh, we also want to let you know that since you have a little time this morning before our sessions start at 1130, that we have on-demand videos available, and those can be accessed through the Whova app, and I believe in the chat, uh, the link is being added now, so you might want to go check out some of those videos. There's quite a few there, so that might be something that um, you can do in this in-between break time. Again, the next set of conference sessions will start at 1130. Just check out the agenda in your app and you can try to figure out where you want to go next. Any other announcements, Amy? I would just say for the rest of the conference, all the sessions you will enter through the app. So unlike yesterday where you entered through a Zoom link, every session will be entered through the app. So we look forward to having you engage with us. Thank you so much for your comments, Dawn. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Kathy and Jennifer and Whitney for your presentation this morning. Again, I apologize for the glitch, but we um, moved forward and I 
just had great messages and great discussions. So thank you. And everyone gets a little time to catch up before we log on again at 1130.